Yeah. A lot of things going on, as I said, in the next month. We'll make sure that we go over those. Uh, as you're aware, um, our schedule now has changed for fall and for the rest of the year with 9.30 Sunday School and 11 o'clock worship. Ernie Couch will be coming. You see in our announcements. That's the 16th, Saturday the 16th at 7 o'clock. So put that on the calendar if you would. Ernie Couch at 7 o'clock this next Saturday. Baby shower and lunch for the Russells. Baby girl is Sunday the 24th. And those of you uh, who will be attending, you'll see there A through L, bring sandwiches, M through Z, bring salads. That's baby shower for the New baby girl. Next, Beaver Creeks Annual Bazaar. That's the 23rd of September, 11 to 3. Come for dinner, fellowship, and crafts. Beaver Creek for their annual bazaar. That's the 23rd. It starts at 11 o'clock. And then the WMF District Rally at Culbertson. Uh, coming up on the 14th. You can see there at 10 o'clock Mountain Time. So. Those of you women who can attend that, please do that also. You're going to meet at the church at 9.30. So 9.30 at the church, you'll head out to Culver's and go around. And then moving on, Joel Finnesgaard will be here on the 15th of October, 7 o'clock. 15th of October, 7 o'clock. And then looking a little bit further on down into October, the men's retreat out of Upper Missouri, 27th and 28th of October. Any other announcements? Yeah, Carol. Linda, a uh, light prayer for um, the Thomas Allen and Florida. Allen from Florida. Small show from Florida. And also Florida for the hurricanes that are getting hit okay. another hurricane. Florida hurricanes. We're fortunate to live in the area of the country that we do. There's a lot of the country right now that's either dealing with fires or hurricanes. Overseas as well. Earthquakes. Remember to pray for those people. I just can't imagine what it must be like to lose everything. Any other announcements? Right. If members haven't looked, there are minutes from the last tertiary meeting in your boxes. If you could read those so we don't have to take time to read them all. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yeah, be sure not doing the service. But be sure and read through the minutes. Um, those of you who came to church and, and didn't remember, we do have our tertiary meetings after we eat today, so we'll have our God provides dinner after the service, and then our tertiary meeting following that. So if you get a chance while you're eating or sometime before our meeting, read through the minutes so we don't have to do it the meeting to save a little time for all of us. Any other announcements? Let's go to our call to worship then. Good. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given to us. We thank you that we have a chance to come together, the freedom to come together as a church, and especially on this rally day of Sunday school starting, and as we prepare to look into your word even more, that you would bless us that your message would become clear to each one of us. And that as the kids go to their Sunday school classes, 
every Sunday morning, that you would be with those teachers, that you would give them the words to say and the things that the kids need to know of you. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to teach our children, and not only that, but to teach each one of us what it is to be Christian and what it is to love you and follow you and to have that promise of eternal life. Father, as we continue to watch what's going on in our nation, in our world, this morning, Lord, we just ask in a special way that you would give strength to those that have been devastated by these storms, the many people that have been, that have lost everything. We know that you are there and can help them, help them to turn to you. Those that have lost their homes in fire, those that have lost their homes in earthquakes and family and friends. We just lay it all before you this morning, knowing that you are big enough and strong enough to overcome. We also look this morning, Lord, as our health needs, those that we have had on the list, those unspoken ones, we ask that you would be with each one of them also in a special way, give them extra strength and comfort in this time. Our missionaries, Lord, and our soldiers, we, we give them to you also. Lift them up in front of you. That you would look down on each one of them and give them peace and comfort. And finally, Lord, as, as we look at each one here this morning, You know our hearts, Lord. You know what we need. You know what we don't need. But this morning, Lord, we're asking for you to just come to each one in a special way. That we would open our hearts, door and ask you to come in and, and give to you 100%. Be with each one this week and each one that's here this morning. We pray. As we open this morning, let's turn and sing hymn number 178. We'll worship the King. Hymn number 178. <coughs>
most gracious Father in heaven, we bow before you to confess our sin and to seek your forgiveness. We do not esteem that we have put ourselves and fall into sin because of our weakness. We know that sin leads to death, but your gift to us is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Strengthen our hearts against sin and forgive us when we fail. Grant to us the promise of eternal life with you in heaven. And you bring us to live here on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Peterson's. It says, Pastor John, I have a prayer request. This is uh, Brian. My mom was diagnosed with liver cancer and E. coli blood infections. Being 86, she is declining any treatment for the cancer. We rejoice in that she has the sure hope of eternal life in heaven. She's ready to go and is without any pain. We pray that the pain will stay away. I've been with her the last three days in Marla with her trips to Bismarck this week and with me to see Molly yesterday is exhausted. So I'm sorry we won't be making it to Williston today. God bless you. So I bring in Brian's views and ask that you please um, add his mom to your prayer list and keep her in prayer. Uh, he asks especially that the pain would stay away uh, as her last days are spent on this earth. And we thank and praise God for the fact that she's trusting in Jesus, the Savior and Lord, together with him. We miss Brian and Marla when they're not here. Continue to keep Marla in their prayers. Today, as we look to God's Word, we first uh, look at Ezekiel and, and see God's call for him to be a watchman, also for us then as well, that God longs to work in and in through us to call people to repentance and faith. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. If you're able, please, uh, let's stand in respect for God's word as we read this text together. God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word that I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die. If you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will die for his sin. And I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways and he does not do so, he will die for his sin. But you will have saved yourself. When we read of God's ministers who minister in the area of secular government, as we call it, uh, from Romans 13, 1 through 10, and, and the responsibility we have as God's children to recognize them as, as God's authority in our life. Romans 13, 1 through 10. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to you for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continued debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Here ends the reading of our scripture. Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word. Thank you. 
confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
text we have today uh, coincides with the beginning of Sunday school and it deals with the children. Uh, children were in Sunday school today, you have teachers in your class, right? But today's text tells us that your teachers need to learn from you. And uh, we see that you have the most important lesson of all for us. That Jesus tells us to look at you and find out how we should be toward our Heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 20. And uh, Mary noticed yesterday while she was getting it ready for the screen that there's only 19 verses here. You'll see verse 11 is missing. I thought I'd explain that a little bit to you. Uh, some of the early translations in English uh, used some manuscripts that contain one more verse that actually is in Luke's Gospel. And it didn't change the doctrine at all, what was inserted. It uh, actually fit quite well. But the earliest manuscripts show that it wasn't there, that some copyist put it in. So verse 11 is missing. But don't think that we've taken away from God's Word. We're trying, as we, well, we talk this all, I'm the one doing the translating. Um, the effort is made that we give God's Word as it was originally written. And we have very reliable and accurate translation. Matthew 18, 1 through 20. And it's a long text, so we'll remain seated. But this is, uh, this is God's Word. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man for whom they come. If your hand or your foot cause causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. These are your words, Heavenly Father, that you gave us through your Son. Pray that by these words you would set us apart unto yourself and your kingdom. Thank you for speaking the truth to us that we may be restored. Lord, 
work in us that we might speak the truth to others. That by your grace as we were restored, so they might also be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The beginning of this text tells us why Jesus gives all this teaching. And, and what it does is it reveals to us what our, what our nature is like. Uh, Jesus had 12 that were closest to him. He had many disciples, many people that followed him. But 12 of them he called to be closer to him than others uh, for the purposes that God had in mind as far as reaching the world with, with a message of hope of, of, because of the finished work of Jesus. Uh, 12 that he drew close to himself in order to be witnesses as to who Jesus is and what he did even as Last week we read of Peter's witness when he said, You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. And of those twelve, three seem to be even closer to Jesus than the twelve in general, uh, Peter, James, and John. So they're walking down the road, uh, going to where Jesus lived in Nazareth. And while they're walking down the road, they're arguing with each other and, and trying to figure out who the greatest of them is in, in the kingdom. They're sure that Jesus is going to establish. They have an earthly kingdom in mind. They, like us, are full of their own importance. Uh, they are willing to acknowledge maybe that others have gifts that they don't have, but certainly that doesn't matter. They're still extremely important, perhaps more important than anyone else. So finally, when they get into the house, they have a question for Jesus. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It seems that our minds are kind of set on this all of our lives. Who's the greatest? It seems we're competing with each other all the time uh, to be one above another to the point where we don't even recognize that there's a God we have self-made importance and if we haven't made ourselves important enough, we will get it done. We have all kinds of sayings among ourselves to thy own self be true and follow your own heart and, and uh, all kinds of ideas of making ourselves great. That's really the substance of sin. That is its foundation. The fact that we don't acknowledge what's actually true and the truth is that none of us is or has anything that didn't come as a gift from God. And so as they're arguing and, and making fools of themselves as to who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, they go to Jesus to have him settle it, and he does something that they didn't expect at all. He called a little child that was present with them. He said, come stand in the middle of the disciples. And, and if we look at Mark, uh, we know that Jesus sat down every time he taught and, and probably then invited this child to sit in his lap. This entire discourse that we read, we need to realize Jesus has this child with him for the disciples to keep their eyes on the entire time because as sinners, we tend to turn in on ourselves all the time. And Jesus is telling his disciples, if you keep doing that, if you keep turning in on yourself, you're not even going to be in the kingdom of heaven much less concerned about what rank you're going to have in that kingdom. He holds his child before them and he says, I tell you the truth. You better pay attention when Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus saying? He's saying that because of our sinful nature, we've wandered away from the truth so far that we're concerned more and more about our greatness and not concerned about knowing the truth and knowing the God from whom all truth emanates. Luther, as he gives us the meaning of the first article of the Creed, tells us that in that first article, we're actually confessing that I believe God created me and all that exists, that he has given and still preserves to me my body and soul, my eyes and ears and all my members, my reason and all the powers of my soul, together with food and clothing, home and family and all my property, that he does this purely out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, 
without any merit or worthiness in me. For all of which I should live my life differently than I do, not seeking greatness for myself. For all of which I am in duty bound to thank, praise, serve, and obey Him, to recognize Him as God. I mean, we live in America right now. We're in a place where there's no hurricanes going on and no fires burning everything down. Where did all these gifts come from? Did I choose to be born in America at the time that I was? Did I choose to be born? And the answer, of course, is no. Life, not only as we receive it initially, but each and every day, is a gift from God. Children receive things as gifts. We've raised four of them. Didn't always like the times that they wanted help. Uh, a lot of times it was two, three in the morning when we wanted sleep. And they'd cry out to us. We'd have to figure out what they wanted. If they were hungry, we got up and fed them. They trusted us to do that. They'd cry out and you know, were totally helpless to do anything for themselves. My mom and dad would get up. Oh yeah, we grumbled because we wanted our own sleep, but we fed them nonetheless. We changed their diapers, put them back in bed, and prayed, God, please, I want them to sleep so I can get some sleep too. Children are dependent on their parents, and they trust their parents to take care of their needs. They trust their parents' love. And while they may not be the most convenient thing to have in the house, we love them anyway if we take care of them. We so often think God is privileged to have me. Look at how wonderful I am. We make God into something little that, that is meant to be there to make sure my desires, my needs, my comfort is first and foremost to Him without recognizing that I'm not even here without Him. That each and every heartbeat that I have, each and every breath I take is a gift from the hand of God. One that I've not earned or deserved. I need them if I'm going to be in line with reality to be like a little child. One who recognizes that I neither earn nor deserve the loving care of God and yet he gives it to me anyway. That all that I am and all that I have is a gracious gift from him. It's only as we come to this point that we are in right relationship with God. And I might add then too that being in right relationship with God now is more complicated because of our sin. Because we've rebelled against recognizing God as God and tried to put ourselves in His place, we need also to be redeemed. We find that we are redeemed in the same way that we were, we were created. Not because we've earned or deserved anything. In the meaning of the second article of the Creed, we read that we believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary is my Lord, who has redeemed me. Who am I, a lost and condemned creature? He's bought and freed me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil. Bought and freed me, paying what? Not silver and gold, but his holy and precious blood and his innocent sufferings and death, in order that I might be restored, in order that I might belong to him, in order that I might live in his eternal kingdom. God gives us his word, and it comes in two forms, law and gospel. We need to hear law so that we become aware of who we are and what we've done, so that we become aware of our greatest needs, so that we become aware of our sin and our sinfulness. Law is not fun to hear. As a matter of fact, we see people around the world, people in our nation, working very, very hard to change the law, calling good evil and evil good. Why are they doing that? It's because they want to be in charge, just like we do. It's because they have the same nature we do. And instead of submitting to the truth that they know is true, that certain things are wrong, that look like what we read about in, in Romans, you shall not kill, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, you shall not commit adultery, no matter what men do in trying to change the law, God's law remains the same. 
And when we long to break God's law for self-fulfillment and hear God's law, it hurts. But God's law never changes. God never changes. When His law convicts, His law is right and we are wrong. His law is meant to cause pain. His law is meant for us to come before God and confess to Him that certainly He's right and I'm wrong, that I deserve His wrath and condemnation. When I come to the point that I acknowledge that I'm a little child who has rebelled against His Heavenly Father, He comes to me not with what I deserve, but what I don't deserve. He comes to me with the good news of the Gospel. He comes to me declaring that because of Jesus' willingness to receive the punishment I deserve for my sin, that I'm forgiven, that I belong to Him, that I'm restored to Him. And so, coming to God means becoming a child again, totally dependent on God for forgiveness of sins, and then to recognize that everything I receive, all the good things I have come from Him. That I'm able to sing the doxology from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory. So rank in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus has the highest rank, of course. Where did He get that highest rank? Well, certainly because He is God. But also because as God, He, like God always has been, is servant of all His creation, came to serve creation, he came to serve mankind by giving his life for us. He loves us, even as we love our children, even more, more than we can understand. And so we see Jesus' strong warnings to us. Warnings that have to do with how we treat children, how we don't look down on them, how we ought instead to recognize that God loves them enough to send a son to die for them and ought to then treasure them enormously. So Sunday school teachers and Pastor John and all those parents who teach their kids, we have an awesome responsibility, don't we? To teach them with regard to God to remain children, to, to never grow up with regard to God, to recognize that before God we're never more than dependent children that need to ask Him for all that we receive and recognize that all we receive is a gracious gift from God. Even, even our sufferings are a gracious gift from God. If God used the suffering of Jesus in order to redeem us, He certainly will use our sufferings for good things as well. We don't like suffering, but God teaches us to be reconciled to Him and come to Him as a loving Father to submit to him as a child submits to his parents. Children submit to their parents when they take them to have somebody stick a needle in their arm and push a plunger. Children submit to their parents when they're brought to a hospital and put under and cut open and have surgery done. They trust their parents to know what's best. God longs for us to come to him as children and trust him as the Heavenly Father always knows and does what is best. To cause one of these little ones to stumble, to teach them something false, to encourage them to believe that they can build their own lives and, and to encourage their prides so that they would abandon God, Jesus says of them, and be better for a millstone to be hung around our neck and tossed in the sea than mislead one of these little ones. Inevitably, sin comes into this world. He says, woe to the one through whom stumbling unto a loss of faith in Christ comes. He speaks in no uncertain terms how dangerous our sinful inclinations are. We are so able to make all kinds of things our God, the treasure we would take hold of, rather than God himself. We're to see that we don't look down on the little ones that God treasures so much, on the little ones whose angels see the face of our Heavenly Father. What about those that are wandering away? Jesus deals with them in verses 12 through 14. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills 
go look for the one that wandered off. I've never owned sheep. I don't care for sheep. You guys know that. I've told you that. I've had four kids. And I tell you, sometimes when we've traveled, we uh, go back to the car from a restaurant or from a fair or wherever we might have been. And, and we all sit out in the car and we count the noses and there's one missing. That ever happened to any other parents here? Where does your heart go immediately? Where is the one that's missing? Our hearts are wrapped up in that one that's missing, that one that saw something and wandered away, didn't stick with the rest of the family. Who knows what it might be? They thought it would be more fulfilling than staying with the family. It, it drew them away from being with the family. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off? When he leave the 99, he, his heart will be concerned about that one. He'll go back up into the mountains where he pastured them and look for that one and rejoices greatly when he finds it. Jesus tells us this, that we might know how precious believers are to our Heavenly Father. When one wanders away, God is deeply concerned and he wants us to have that same concern to share his heart that we wouldn't be looking at others who are wandering away and, and saying things like, wow, I remain faithful. What is wrong with that person who's wandering off? That's not being like a child at all, is it? Being like a child is recognizing that if I'm still in the flock, it's because of God's law and God's gospel that has called me and continues to work in me, not only as he brought me to faith, but through that word, he keeps me in the faith. I have nothing to be proud of. And when I see someone wandering off, I can't in pride stand there and judge them. Yes, they wandered off. I need to recognize that. But the Father longs to bring that one back into the fold. He cares about those who are wandering away. And so ought we. And so we read in the last verses 15 through 20 about the disposition we're to have toward brothers and sisters in Christ, toward our the fellow members in our congregation or in our family. If our brother sins against us, if, if they're doing something that obviously is leading them to trust in something, leading them into their pride to, to find a treasure other than Christ, if I see that happening, then I'm to go and talk to that one gently. Talk to that one, not just once, but time after time after time. Let them know my concern and point out their fault. Do they want to hear it? No. Do I like to hear my faults? No. We don't like to hear them. But their faults nonetheless. When our faults become our treasure, when we want to nurse our faults and hang on to them and not deal with them honestly, we're wandering away from God. Jesus says, go yourself and talk to the one you see wandering off. Why yourself? Because our purpose is not to go around and talk to others about, about this person who's going astray. Our purpose is to restore that one. Our longing is to bring that one back into the flock. If they listen, he won your brother over. Rejoice with God. If he won't listen to you, then the next step is to take two or three others. That testimony might be born and that concern might be shown toward one who's wandering away. And the hope is that this wandering one would be won over. If he refuses to listen to them, to the church, then he needs to go. We need to be very, very careful with these words. If he refuses to listen even to the church, if the whole church says, we're concerned about you. We see you treasuring whatever the treasure might be instead of Christ. We see you wandering away from Christ. Here's your sin. And they refuse to listen to the church. You're to treat them as a pagan or a tax collector. Does that mean now finally they have fallen to a point that we say, well, huh, at least we're faithful. Too bad you wandered away. And the answer to that question is absolutely not. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? He went to seek and to save those that were lost. In other words, we're to never give up. In our hearts, we're to continue to seek to bring a person who's wandered away 
back to Christ, that they might repent and turn away from those things they've embraced, turn away from their pride, and trust in God and in Christ whom he sent to be their Savior. When one is wandering away and we speak the law, what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. When we speak to a person as a congregation and say, we see which way you're going and from all we see, you are lost. Heaven agrees. We can't change God's law to restore such a one. What's needed is that they repent and turn back to God for forgiveness. Turn back to acknowledge God as God. And when they turn back, whatever we lose on earth, which means we declare your sins forgiven, you are set free from your sin, is loosed in heaven. We do this also with prayer. Verses 19 and 20 must not be taken out of context. They're not a carte blanche where God says, if two of you agree that you want a Mercedes Benz and you come to God and ask him for it, he's going to give it to you. In the context, this child is still standing with the disciples. What it's saying is that as we're seeking those who are lost, it's a task bigger than we can handle, is it not? Can we convert somebody else who's wandering away? And the answer is no. These verses call us to pray. That we come together and pray for those that are lost. Come together uh, first with the witnesses that we bring and then with the entire congregation. Praying for the well-being of the person who is lost. Agreeing together and bringing the need to God. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you. We're not alone in bringing those who are wandering away. Jesus is with us. He can do in the hearts of those around us things we can't do. We see some of the most notorious sinners in history coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Indeed, the, the epistle lesson we read today was written by a man who, who both uh, imprisoned and killed Christians. Yet God won him over, and he became the apostle to the Gentiles. When we become self-righteous, we're just simply expressing our fallen nature in a different way than a lot of people in the world. But it's still fallen nature. To be part of God's kingdom means that we give up our pride or have God take away our pride is a better way to say it, through his word. That we acknowledge that when God is speaking, when he speaks his truth and what he calls sin, whether it be in somebody else or me, that's what it is. God with his word binds us in order that we might be set free, in order that we might cry out for mercy and grace and be restored as children and recognizing that I'm a wandering sheep and that God is a loving, good shepherd. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you long to bring us back into the fold when we wander. Lord, we acknowledge that as we look inside ourselves, we see that we've not fully arrived yet, that while we trust in you as you've given us the gift of trust, childlike trust, many things are alluring to us and would tempt us to wander away. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we look for strength in ourselves, you make it evident that there is no strength in ourselves by which we can remain faithful to you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for brothers and sisters around who continually proclaim your word that we might always be aware of our need, that we might always be aware of your longing to bring us into the flock and willingness to pay the price, that we would be restored to you. Father, I pray you work in each heart and each life through all circumstances that you allow to happen in our lives. Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Last hymn is from the children's section of our hymn book. Beautiful uh, prayer and song, number 383. We'll stand as we sing the Savior while my heart is tender.